As we get into the Word this morning, I've got a question for you. What do you have an appetite for? Um, last night we had a birthday dinner for Mallory, our daughter, and, and we, had, uh, we had burritos, and so we cooked steak and chicken. Does anybody in here like steak? <clears throat> Amen. You know, how about do you, anybody like chicken? I worked with a guy that said uh, that he would not eat yard bird. He called it yard bird. Um, what about like like hamburgers? Like who likes Burger King? Anybody in here like Burger King? McDonald's? Uh, like no, thank you. Uh, Chick Fil A. You know the worst thing about Chick Fil A is they're not open on Sunday. So anybody else? Anybody else got anything that's that they have an appetite for that they like? They maybe. Brisket, yeah, barbecue. We're in Texas. If you don't like brisket, you don't like barbecue, there's something wrong, right? Pork ribs. Tacos. That was going to be my, I was going to close out with that, was tacos. Because everybody loves tacos, right? I preached a sermon on that once. Everybody loves tacos. We're going to talk about what you have an appetite for this morning. Because each one of us likes things, and we're not necessarily talking about food now, although we were, but each of us like different things, right? We like different things in our lives. Maybe, uh, maybe you like a Chevy. Anybody in here a Chevy person? Uh, anybody in here a Ford person? I'm sorry, we'll pray for you. <laughs> um, so we, we have different likes and dislikes. Some people are Apple and some people are Android and those kind of things. So we have different appetites for different things. We're going to look at the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 1. And this was after Jesus, he had went into prayer and fasting for 40 days. And so he, he had he brought him, himself into a place where Satan was going to tempt him. And it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward, he was hungry. So even Jesus had an appetite. <clears throat> now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. <clears throat> so as created beings, everyone in here is a created being. And as a created being, God put things into you that you need to live uh, you have to have air to breathe. You have to have food to eat. But God's being te Jesus is being tempted by the devil at this point in time. And he says, uh, if you are the son of God, uh, just go ahead and make these stones turn to bread and you can provide for yourself the things that you need. And God rebuffs him. Jesus rebuffs him and says, have you not heard that it is written that man shall not live by bread alone? Jesus is telling him, I need to know what the heart of the Father is, what the will of the Father is, the words that He speaks into my life, that's what brings life to me. Amen? See, we're talking about food, we're talking about bread, a sustenance that would bring life. <clears throat> but Jesus says, there's something more important to my life than bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. <clears throat> See, and as I set up this, term, this sermon this morning, it's not hard to see that as created beings for living, we need to be connected to the Father. That brings us life. Amen. We need to develop an appetite for the things of God. Amen. See, 
Jesus quoted this scripture. This was a scripture that came out of Deuteronomy when he said that to Satan. In Deuteronomy 8, verse 1 says, Every commandment I command you today must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commands or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. So in the Old Testament and the New Testament, both, the Word of God says that man doesn't live just by bread alone, but by the words that proceed out of the mouth of God. And we live in a day and time, church, you can see everything that's going around in the world today. And it's easy to tell that there's all kinds of things you can fill your life with. Now, when I talk about these things, you know, I might talk about somebody's hobby and you're like, hey, Pastor Clay, you're, you're telling me I can't go and play golf. That is not what I'm saying this morning. Billy and Angie, they race horses and, and Billy in the past did rodeo for years and years and years. Now Quinn goes to rodeos and I'm not saying you can't go to rodeos. I'm, I'm not saying you can't occupy those things in your life. What I am saying is when those things in your life become more important to you than God, then there is a problem. You've developed an appetite for the things of the world, and any of those things can be something in this world that takes the place of God. It could be your job. It could be relationships. It could be any kind of lustful desire that you have that comes in and takes the place of God, and all of a sudden you desire those things more than you desire the things of God. Amen? Does it happen, church? Because I'm telling you right now, even as a pastor and filling a pulpit of a church, that those kinds of things can happen to me. I can get distracted with the things of this world and put them ahead of God, and it could be anything. Because I allowed myself to develop an appetite for something else besides the Lord. <clears throat> I remember one time I asked everybody in here what they liked. Does anybody in here like cornbread? It's, it's been cold. Maybe you like chili and cornbread. You know, you had snow on the ground, maybe like beans and cornbread. When I was growing up, my dad used to take cornbread and put it in a glass and he'd pour buttermilk on it. And, uh, you know, that seems pretty gross to me. I never much was a fan of cornbread, and especially not buttermilk. I remember one time I was roofing houses and we were in Wellington, Texas. And we was going to be there for a few days. And we got there at dark and we worked till dark. And we went into town to eat at a restaurant. And we go in and we all order the special and they bring the food to us. I, I can't remember what it was, but I do remember that it had a, a slice of cornbread on there. And I thought to myself, I'm not eating that because I didn't like cornbread. <clears throat> and then we went back to work. And this was in the summer. And of course, you know, in the summer in the Texas Panhandle that the days are about, I don't know, 15 hours long. We'd worked all day, ate lunch, and it was probably nine o'clock by the time I got to eat again. And let me tell you something, I was ravenous by that time came. I was hungry. So the next day we went back to Wellington, roofed the house, 
went to the restaurant to eat at lunch, got the special, and they bring out whatever it was, and they had a slice of cornbread on it. Now, I was starving the day before, and so this day, I ate everything on my plate. I knew it was going to be another long day, and so I'm like, I'm not going to be starving by the end of the day. I'm going to eat this cornbread. And so I ate, I ate the cornbread. Um, and so I think it did something to me being so hungry. I decided that cornbread wasn't that bad. <laughs> and so my appetite for things like that was changed almost in an instant because I had a great and dire need. I was very hungry and I needed something to eat. And I wasn't going to... I ate everything that was on my plate. I think the the little garnish they put on there, little leaves and stuff, I think I ate that too. Because I was ravenous. But I like cornbread to this day. Because my way of thinking changed about what I needed to survive. Amen? I want you to keep... Keep that in mind. You see, the Bible, the Bible is a book, and the testimony of Jesus Christ in the Bible testifies, you know, we read that he went and was tempted, right? He was tempted. The reason he was tempted is because he was tempted in all the things, all the areas of life that we, we as humans would be tested in. Jesus was tempted with power. He was tempted with flesh. Uh, He was tempted with all these things, but he did that so us, we would have an example of how to be overcomers like Jesus was overcomer, right? So even though we fail, we have a way out. Amen? But the Bible is meant to be bread for daily use. I want you to get that, and I didn't make this up, I read this, but I'd never seen it before. The Bible is meant to be bread for daily use and not cake for a special occasion. Amen? See, a lot of times we use the Bible when our life gets out of sorts, we go through troubles and hard times, then we turn to God and we want to pursue God. God, come in and fix my life, and then I'll go back to the things that I was doing. That's like having cake on a special occasion. God, I don't need you all the time. I just need you when I need you. And that's not having an appetite for the things of God. That's having more concern for yourself and your troubles. Even as Christians, we can have an appetite for ungodly things. Amen? You see it in churches across America, and and it makes headlines news whenever a big pastor of a prominent church somewhere has a moral failure. I mean, because it happens, right? Even men of God have some type of moral failure sometimes. And, And what I would say to that is that they allowed themselves to have an appetite for something ungodly into their life. Does that make them, does that make God love them any less? No, it doesn't. Uh, if I fail, it doesn't change who God is. And it doesn't change anybody else either. We all need the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ in our life. Amen. All of us. But if you have an appetite for ungodly things, you will end up looking like the world. Is that a true statement this morning? I mean, if, if you're pursuing God, reading your Bible, um, being kind to people, loving people, which is what the Bible says that we should do as Christians, is love others. If you're doing those things that God calls us to do, Guarding your hearts from the things of the world that tries to come in. And look, it's easy. It's easy to look at, you know, your neighbor has a big new house 
and they just built that house. I sure would like to have a new house. And it's easy for those wheels to start turning in your mind. You know, my life would be better if I had a new house. My, my life would be better. <clears throat> my life would be better if I had that new Ford. No, nobody says that. They say, they'd say, my life would be better if I had a new Chevy. <laughs> right? Amen! Preacher, preach it! It's not, it's not bad if you go out and get you a new car. <clears throat> it's not bad if you go and buy a new house. But if that's the thing that drives you, if that's the thing that you think about, if that's the thing, if I could just get a new job that paid 100K a year, if I could just get that car, if I could just get that house, if I could just get those new shoes, I, I, a new suit, whatever it is, if those are the things that drive you, then there's something wrong. I mean, we got to have jobs to supply our, for our families, amen? And Bobby preached about jobs last year, last week about being thankful for a job. So we have to work, we have to provide, make provision. God allows us to do that. But when we get our eyes off of Him and start to get our eyes on ourselves, then that's where the problem lies. Amen? <clears throat> Romans 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. <coughs> he says, and do not be conformed to this world. The author here in Romans says, do not be conformed to this world. Do not consume the things of this world. Do not let the world overtake you and don't become a person that looks like everybody else in the world with the desires of the things of the world, but be transformed. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says, you need to start consuming the things that are going to renew your mind. Well, what is that? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You need to consume the will of God for your life. For I say, though the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one, to each one a measure of faith. God has given each one of us a measure of faith. <clears throat> And so we should decide in our hearts, are we going to pursue that and pursue what God wants for our lives? Like Brother Billy said this morning, God's got a purpose for everyone in here. Now, do you believe that or not? Yes. I hear my grandson back there in the back. But do not be conformed to this world. It is God's desire that you do not end up looking like everybody else in the world. <clears throat> Does that mean you can't have a new car? No. Does that mean you can't have a, a new truck? As long as it's a GMC, you can't have it. Chevy. Somebody's going to hear this. A pastor, he's, he's anti-Ford. See, everyone has a doctrine or theology. Even people who say, well, I'm an atheist. I don't, I, don't care. I don't believe in God. You have doctrine in your heart. Or you have theology in your heart. You're believing something. You can't just believe nothing. You're believing something. You're believing that either God exists or He doesn't exist. Or He loves you and He doesn't love you. Or He loves everybody else, but He doesn't love me because I've done too much bad stuff and people don't know who I am. They don't know the real things that I've done. That is a flawed theology this morning. 
church. God loves you no matter who you are and no matter what you have done. Amen? Man, everybody in this place should be saying amen to that. God loves you no matter who you are or what you've done. That doesn't mean He loves what you have done, but He loves you. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. It says, And He Himself gave, gave some to be apostles, prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, that Jesus was the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That means we shouldn't compare ourselves to one another. You shouldn't look at me and say, Oh, Pastor Clay is so holy and he's so good and he's so uh, he's such great speaker and he drives a Chevy pickup and I want to be just like him. I don't drive a Chevy pickup, by the way. <clears throat> you shouldn't compare yourself to me because the Bible says that my righteousness is like filthy rags. So if you're looking at me because I'm a pastor, I think, man, that guy's got it together. He's got it figured out. You shouldn't be looking at me. You should be looking at Jesus Christ. He's the one that all of us should be pointing our lives to. Amen? <clears throat> Knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children. And this is what I want to point out here. We should no longer be children. How would we, and this is talking spiritually, church, how do you, go from a place of no longer being children to being a mature adult in Christ. You have to develop an appetite for the things of God. Amen? And not have an appetite for the things of this world. See, this is what it sounds like when we're children when we act like children, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things to him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its shares, causes growth of the body for the edifying itself in love. <clears throat> Everybody in this place has been called to be a part of the family of God. Do you know that you yourself sitting here on a on a church pew, a church chair this morning, that God has called you into His family, and not just for yourself this morning. See, sometimes we look at this and we think, well, it's about me. Jesus calls me to know Him because He wants me to be in the church. But let me tell you something. It's not just about you this morning. God has called you to be in His family. That way you can minister to other people and build them up and draw them in. You have responsibility this morning. That God has called you to be in His family. You have responsibility. Does that mean you're going to be a preacher or a teacher or any of the other things, a prophet? No, not necessarily. But God, at the very least, God is calling you to encourage other people. And there might be somebody sitting in here this morning and say, well, that's not me, Pastor Clay. And that's not true. If you believe that you're not called this morning, <clears throat> that is flawed theology. That is flawed doctrine. I can remember a time when I was in my teens and my sisters were serving God and I was not. And I wanted to serve God, but I didn't understand how easy it was. I didn't understand that there was nothing that I could do to be good enough for God. <clears throat> I had flawed theology. I thought, 
well, maybe one of these days I'll be good enough and I can earn God's love. I remember that. I can remember being so frustrated with church when I was a young man because my sisters served God, my parents served God, and I was the black sheep and I was an outcast and I thought, I will never... I, I, I ain't going to heaven because I don't know how to get there. I don't know what to do to get there. Has anybody ever felt like that? I don't know what I got to do to get there. And it turns out that the only thing that God wants for me is for me to believe. That if I believe in the name of Jesus and the fact that He was a son of God and be vulnerable enough to take that step. This is a true story this morning, church. This, is, this was my view of how church worked. Salvation is for those people that are good and holy, and it's not for me. Because I can't be good enough. That was my theology. But that's not... I was sitting here saying those words, and I know my mom just kind of shook her head because I think it probably broke her heart just a little bit to hear me say that. My parents raised me to believe in God. There comes a time in your life where you have to believe in God on your own merit, on your own. You have to decide it in your own heart. You can't live on your parents' faith anymore. Well, well, my mom and dad served God, so, so I'm going to serve God. Sooner or later, you have to decide for yourself. Do I really believe what the Bible says? Do I believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for me, even though I'm a reprobate? And I'm getting off track here. If you get anything out of all that rambling right there, church, this morning... My hope is that you know that God loves you. No matter what you have done, that God loves you. And you could have done all the most horrible things in the world. Think about King David in the Old Testament. And he had a man murdered so he could protect his mistress. And he had her husband murdered and the Bible says that King David was a man after God's own heart. Oh, we only got 30 minutes left. We're good. That's a joke. It's like, it's like talking about GMC and Chevys. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Develop for yourself an appetite for the things of God is what this is saying. Have an appetite for the things of God. Allow God to do things in your life that are going to be eternal. Buying a new car is not an eternal thing. Buying a new, building a new house is not going to be an eternal thing. If you do those things, God bless you. It doesn't mean you're going to hell. I'm not saying those kind of things. I'm just saying we should be concerned about the eternal. Amen? We should be concerned about the eternal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You can look at your life this morning, church. If we take an inventory of ourselves and we say, what is valuable to us this morning? Because every one of us has a theology. Every one of us has things in our lives that are valuable to us. Amen? It could be different things. Family, friends, um, rodeoing. If you looked at your life and said, where, where do I spend my money? 
Now, and I'm not telling you this to say, okay, you need to come up and give to the church now. That's not what this is about. If we were just taking an inventory of our lives, and I looked up and I said, well, I spend most of my money at Walmart, so I must value Walmart. That was kind of a joke. Anybody else pay the cover charge at Walmart? You go to Walmart, you're going to have to pay at least $200, right? They just take it from you before you even go in the door. Here you go, $200, just entry fee. <laughs> if you looked at my life, what do I spend my life doing? Where the thing that's valued... See, one of the most valuable things that you have is your time. How do you spend your time? Do you spend it on yourself because you're selfish? Hey Amen. I've, church, I've been there. What can I do next for me? Or do we invest it in other people because we find them valuable to the kingdom of God? Amen. We need to develop an appetite for those things. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Invest in the kingdom of God. Invest in people. Invest in people. Amen? People that are hurting. People that are broken. People that need their lives to be changed. Amen? How many of you are here this morning because somebody spoke life to you that you didn't understand? The life of Jesus Christ. Somebody relayed that message to you and all of a sudden you're like, there's hope for me. My life is broken and messed up, but there is somebody that loves me no matter what. And my life don't have to be messed up all the time. Amen? I'm going to ask the worship team to come back at this time. We're going to dismiss. We're going to pray. Turn my mic back on. My hope this morning is that this message would be a message that would challenge you. That we'd take some inventory about what we value. And it's okay to value going to work. It's okay to have hobbies, go play golf, go fishing. Amen, Todd? How oh, he ain't in here. <laughs> Todd might be the only person I know that goes fishing every day. It's okay to do those things. But we can't allow those things to take place of God in our life. And it's easy to do. Even as believers. Even as believers. It's easy to let those things creep into our life. Amen? So let's rise to our feet. I'm going to pray for you. We're going to do another worship song and Bobby will close us out. Let's bow our heads. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. God, we pray that you would stir a hunger in us. for the things of you. God, we pray that you change our hearts to value the things that you value and not the things that this world values. God, if we value the things of this world, we could never, ever, ever get enough of them for us to fill the hole that's in our hearts and in our spirits. A hole that was made that only you can fill. <clears throat> God, we pray that you would stir up something inside of us to want to know you more. 
that you'd change our hearts, you'd change our minds, you'd change the way that we think to value your things more. God, we ask that you'd forgive us where we've failed you. God, I look at my life and I've failed you so miserably. But I pray that you would draw us all and call us to something greater than we know. Amen? Amen.